tonight. We're going to have some fun. All right. Leslie, thank you so damn much. Okay. We are, we are in. All right. So it's fabulous to see all of you. I hope you and your families are well. And what we're going to do tonight is finish our discussion of part one, chapter one of Foucault's Discipline and Punish. And we left off on Thursday talking about Foucault's analysis, very general analysis of what happens uh, in some ways that signal that whatever you want to call this feudal aristocratic paradigm that and 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 and, and this paradigm in, in which the example of the torture the, the 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 grotesque physically violent and torture and death of of damien was normal right this 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 kind of that was a parrot this is this is a this is a discourse for Foucault. And it was a discourse because it had its own internal logic, as we talked about last week. And, and we left off sort of gesturing uh, from Foucault's point of view about why this discourse is fading away. Um, it's coming to an end. It's, it's literally breaking down. And, and it is coming apart, it is fading away, and it is breaking down while simultaneously a kind of new discourse that Foucault will call the Enlightenment is emerging in various places in Europe as early as the 1600s, right? It's gaining speed in, philosophy, in the philosophical areas, it's gaining speed in the kind of uh, emergence of the normative social and behavioral and medical sciences. It's gaining speed politically. The US Constitution is gonna be formulated and the, the, it's the, the Declaration of Independence is written in 1776, Constitution 1789. So there's this, there's this new stream of political views. So whatever, whatever becomes the Enlightenment as a discourse, and, and as it comes to replace the discourse of this kind of feudal aristocratic view, these things are kind of happening simultaneously, right? One discourse is, is, is ending, it's fading away, it's literally breaking down, while simultaneously whatever is going to replace it, whatever emerges, is already kind of happening, it's right? It's, Hobbes is writing in the 1650s, right? Locke is already writing in the 1750s, in the 1780s. Galileo is already writing in the late 1500s. Um, you know, uh, Adam Smith is writing Capital, and I, I think he's in what, Scotland? Um, you know, these, these things are happening, and, and they're happening in various pockets, right? And, and they're developing. And they're going to come and they're going to kind of overcome this, this feudal aristocratic discourse. And, and, and again, this is, this is important as an idea because in the bigger scheme of postmodernism in general, right, it is this whole movement this contestation of ideas that is always already going on, right? Whatever, whatever language is, whatever meaning, value, and purpose is, it's always already a human invention. It's always already an assertion of power, and it's always already contested, right? We saw that in Nietzsche, right? Meaning is intensely, inherently agonistic. It's contested, right? By its very essence, in a way, because it's a human invention. It's an assertion of power. It's asserted into a world that in and of itself doesn't have meaning. And, and, and meaning changes. People compete over what things should mean and what things should have value and how things should be arranged. Right, so, so meaning is contingent. It's very unstable and it's undergoing constant transformation. 
And, and as we move, as we segue from Foucault's account, a very brief account, very general account of the end, the breaking down of whatever this feudal aristocratic paradigm was, and, and the way Foucault used the torture as a vehicle to, to tell the story of that, of that discourse. However, that is coming apart and a new discourse is coming is perfectly in line with a kind of postmodern analytic. Meaning and value and purpose are human inventions, they're assertions of power, right? And therefore, meaning at any given time is unstable and subject to very profound transformation. And now we're witnessing that moment. We're witnessing, we're witnessing a, a new human invention from the postmodern point of view. The Enlightenment discourse is a new human invention, even though the people engaged in it think they're doing something objectively true, right? So whatever Enlightenment discourse is emerging is a new poem, it's a new human invention of language, of meaning, of value, of purpose, right? It's also therefore an assertion of power, hence disciplinary power. And it emerges out of a kind of contestation with what preceded it. In this case, this kind of feudal aristocratic discourse. And in many ways, in many ways, I, I, I guess if we had another to really torture you guys, if we had another three weeks of the course, we could, we could say that even now, what's left of the late modern enlightenment discourse is coming apart. There is a new discourse that is emerging right now. We, we are witnessing the end in many ways of the enlightenment discourse that begins in the 1650s and has kind of found semi-perfection in 2021 but it's, it's breaking apart, it's coming apart. Something new is coming. And we're in that transition mode, right? And, and, and you guys, in some ways, you guys are part of that transition mode. You, you've had it with patriarchy, you've had it with misogyny, you've had it with, with extraordinary economic and racial and social injustice. You've had it. As a, as, a, as a series of ideas, All right? And you're fighting for something new. And interestingly enough, even like the people, the Hobbeses and the Locks and the Adam Smiths and the emerging social scientists, even like those people 200 years ago were fighting for something new, like, like they who thought they were doing something objectively true, in many ways we are mobilized by that energy. You, you're political scientists, right? You think that the, 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 the knowledge you've acquired is kind of objectively true and good for you and good for the culture. And now you want to acquire new knowledge, get rid of the patriarchy, get rid of the misogyny, get rid of the, the, the hatred and get rid of the injustice. Right? And, and, and you're going you're gonna to build something new. You're, you're going to give birth to a new discourse that you think is objectively true. Okay. You're living it. We're living Foucault's analysis. All right? So this idea that as this discourse associated with this feudal aristocratic system and, and, and Foucault uses just the, the torture as a vehicle, to, kind of a metaphorical vehicle for the whole system, as that's breaking down and coming apart, something else, the Enlightenment, is emerging. And it's emerging episodically here and there. Right? And it's finally going to assert itself. And we know it's going to finally assert itself when we see, right, this fundamental change. One, one example is how we punish, right? And that's why Foucault juxtaposes these two stories of punishment. Now we are witnessing the end of the feudal aristocratic discourse. And we're witnessing the end of it through this one example of, of how they punished people. They physically tortured and killed people as a public spectacle. 
to convey power, okay. And now we're seeing finally the emergence of this enlightenment discourse with the emergence of the boys' home, with the emergence of a new type of punishment in the prison, a new way of organizing the army, right? And so, so we left off on Thursday talking about a couple of things. And there's just two more things I want to say, and then we, can, then we can do what we have to do today. So we left off on Thursday talking about, in some ways, why that feudal aristocratic system was breaking down, right? And, and there were two really kind of important takeaways from that. Uh, and, and again, Foucault was generalizing from these two small examples, to be sure. But we have some sense that this discourse is breaking down because, because whatever they intended to do in, in this very elaborate, well-planned, morally, religiously, politically, legally sanctioned, socially sanctioned, grotesque torture and execution of this person kind of broke down. I mean, of course, they finally killed him, to be sure, right? But the process itself failed. The technology, the physical techniques, uh, the, the, the pincers and the acid and the horses, they, the, 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 tech, the material technologies of power failed to do what they were supposed to do. And they failed publicly. And not only did the material technologies, the material instruments, the material technologies fail, but also the moral and political purposes, the moral and political purposes of the torture and the execution failed. Several times a priest comes up, asks Damien if he wants to make amends, if he wants to, to, to make amends. And, and, and Damien says no. Right, so, so they can't extract from Damien the moral and political purposes of, of the torture. And so the paradigm breaks down on a kind of a material and technological sense. The torture doesn't do what it's supposed to do and it breaks down on a kind of a moral and political sense. He never says he's sorry. Damien never makes amends. He never says he's sorry. So the power, the moral and the political power of the king is never reasserted. At the end of the day, it's just violence that's done to him. And it's a violence that is so grotesque that the audience kind of finally starts to think, God, this is too much. Right? And it, so <laughs> that's got to be pretty fantastic violence for a sort of too much violence from a torture. And so, so Foucault uses those two examples to kind of convey this message of the discourse is breaking down. The discourse is breaking down because it can no longer do what it needs to do in both of its material and technological necessities and its moral and political necessities. And therefore, the Enlightenment is going to design better material technologies, the three power, the three strategies, and provide a new moral and political argument. Now, in addition to that, I, I just want to say two things which help kind of broaden this, this transition, okay? Um, and they're just two. There are probably a whole bunch more. We, if we had time, we could identify. But, but there are also two other profound historical things happening. Two other really profound historical things happening that help kind of, kind of end this feudal aristocratic discourse and, and kind of usher in the Enlightenment discourse. There are two things that are happening in Europe and to a less extent globally, but there are two things that are happening that also facilitate the emergence of the Enlightenment. And they're both connected. One, during this time, 1650s, all the way to the 1800s, 1900s, there is a massive transition in Europe from an, a, a rural 
an agrarian based economy to manufacturing, right? I mean, think about that. And we know this, right? Any, any high school history class, they will tell you this. From the 1650s to the 1800s, what is discovered and what is, what is mobilized throughout society? Machinery, factories, tech, steel, machineries, industrialization, all of that is taking place. It's taking place across Europe, right? And what it's doing is it's fundamentally altering the economic and social relationships of Europe, right? Prior to industrialization, right? Prior to the emergence of what we would call generalized industrialization, the European economy was agriculturally based. It was agrarian. Wealth was generated out of large pieces of land. Those lands produced resources. The owners of those resources traded them and sold them for other wealth, right? Prior to industrialization, well, it was feudal, right? Prior to the emergence of this fully operational emerging industrial machine-based society, right? It was feudal, hence the word feudal aristocratic, right? It was, the economy was agrarian. It was farming. And so one of these very powerful things that are happening, historical things that are happening, is you've got the end of an agrarian-based economy and the emergence of industrialization. And because you have the, the end of agriculture and an agrarian-based economy and the emergence of wealth and power in industrialization, right? You have the mass migration, and this is the second thing that happens. You have the mass migration of people from the, from the countryside to the city, right? This is critical. And, and, it, and it is funny and it makes sense. And, when, and, and in the next couple of lectures, when we talk about really how these different strategies, how and why these different strategies of disciplinary power work, you go, oh, yeah, that course, that makes sense. So, so what happens are two things. One, the agrarian-based economy is ending and industrialization in the age of machinery is emerging. And because that is happening, you have two, a mass migration, tens of millions of people, tens of millions of people leaving the, the rural areas, the countryside, the feudal, the, the, the feudal estates, you have tens of millions of people leaving the countryside and they're going to live in cities because that's where the factories are. The factories are in the cities. So you have this mass migration, massive migration of peasants, literally feudal peasants. Prior to the enlightenment, prior to the age of industrialization, 95% of people who lived on planet earth were feudal peasants. They, they lived in small villages on massive landed estates in the middle of nowhere. They never traveled more than two miles from where they were born and they worked in agriculture. They were peasants, they were feudal peasants who had no education. There was nothing written about them. Nobody gave a damn about them. They were, as we've been saying, invisible. They were invisible. But now technology is changing. The discourse is changing. We are moving from agrarian and agricultural based economies to industrialized economies. The entire socioeconomic system is changing and it's changing rapidly. And what that means is tens of millions of people. And when I say people, I mean peasants, I mean feudal serfs people who were considered part of the property of the feudal lord, peasants, serfs, uneducated peasants, undisciplined, uneducated peasants. And those peasants are now moving to the cities 
and they're moving to the cities to work in factories. So it's not just the fact that this discourse, this feudal aristocratic discourse about punishment is breaking down. It is, it absolutely is. The technologies fail. Dorian never says he's sorry. The, the, the paradigm is breaking, the discourse is breaking down. It can no longer do what it needs to do. All right, so new ideas are kind of emerging. It's not just that, that one discourse replaces another because of that. It's also the case that as we leave a feudal economy, a feudal social system, as people move from, from, from working, from working in fields to working in factories, and as people leave the countryside and these small villages and go to the cities. These are two major historical drivers of why the Enlightenment emerges in the way that it does. And this is key. This is absolutely key to Foucault's, Foucault's analysis of disciplinary power. Just think about it, right? It, it makes sense. Now, now, you have people who, who used to, to, to be farmers, peasants. There was no training to be a peasant. You got up when the sun came up and you, you did your manual labor, you, you extracted from the land what you could, the sun went down, you went to bed. And you worked for about eight months or seven, eight months in the summer and for the other four or five months in the winter, you hoped you didn't starve to death. That was fucking it. That was your life. You were a peasant working in agriculture. The only sense of time you had, maybe you had a calendar, maybe. The, the only sense of time you had, sun's up, it's time to work, summertime. Sun's down, can't work anymore. Right? That was your sense of time. Didn't, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a peasant, it doesn't matter if it's three o'clock or four o'clock or one, sun's up, you work. And, and you work in the spring and the summer. You harvest it all by October and you hope from October to, to March, you don't starve to death because it's fucking cold. And there's snow and you can't work anyways. Okay. So you had all these people live in that reality for a thousand years, for 1,500 years. And now that entire economy, that social and social economic system of feudalism is now giving way to industrialization. And so you have all these peasants leaving agricultural work to factory work. And that means they're leaving the country and they're going to the city. And so another important reason driving this is now you've got to do something with these people. You've got to, you've got to turn peasants into factory workers. And you've got to somehow figure out a way to control all these people in, in, the, in, in the new urban slums. So, so these two factors are also really important in the emergence of what Foucault will call the Enlightenment discourse, driven by its three main strategies, the total control and routinization of time and space, the creation of architecture to maximize the observation of the people inside of it, and to induce in those people an internalized awareness that they are always being watched, so they behave, so they become self-disciplining, and then the creation and then the creation and deployment of an infinite number of examinations. Right? And, and, at the risk of sounding snarky, right, this is you. It still is. CSUN has turned the children and the grandchildren of peasants into political scientists. CSUN, the Enlightenment Discourse, CSUN, 
has turned the children of working class people, of peasants and farmers into, into lawyers, into doctors, into political scientists. Right? The Enlightenment discourse has turned peasants into lawyers. Your living proof. All right. And now Foucault is going to tell that story. Now we're going to hear that story. And the last thing I want to say before we tell the story and finish book one, or at least begin to tell the story, is remember the key here, right? Foucault is a postmodernist, right? He's extraordinarily suspicious about the existence of what? An objective truth. And so in addition to that, he's really more concerned about what the consequences to our minds, our bodies, and our politics are that result from our belief in truth and our commitment to its normative and moral practices. Because he sees those things as constructing subjectivity. So that's the game here. Foucault is now going to tell the story about how you and I have been constructed to be the people that we are and do the things that we are. In the hopes of illuminating to us that there is no objectively true sense, true subjectivity, and that what we call our identity and our personality is in fact the object and the vehicle of power. Okay, got that? Okay, let's have some fun. <laughs> Page 14. So we are now transitioning into Foucault's analysis of the emergence of the enlightenment. And he's going to tell us the story of the emergence of the enlightenment through the example once again, through the example of the emergence of a new type of punishment, right? That's the, that the, the, the metaphor for the book. The vehicle for this is the emergence of a new type of what? Punishment, right? Now we don't, we don't grotesquely torture and execute people in this public display. Now we do something else. We incarcerate them. We give them therapy. We find out why they did what they did so we can fix them. So we can return them into society so they're good citizens, right? That's, again, I, I realize our, our current political penal system that is, is, is a lot worse, but, but that's the idea, right? That's the idea. All right, so page 14. And I'm gonna move the pages back and forth a little bit, okay? So page 14, right in the middle of the page. Here we go. At the beginning of the 19th century, the early 1800s, right? The early 1800s, at the beginning of the 19th century, then the great spectacle of physical punishment disappeared. And he's talking about the execution. And he's also talking about the disappearance of a whole discourse. Slowly, this entire feudal aristocratic discourse, along with this, this public torture and execution, is disappearing. And it's taking time. <clears throat> Started around the 1650s, right? It's kind of picking up speed episodically here and there. It's kind of moving. The old discourse is fading. Things are kind of coming together. To be sure, they're overlapping and mixing. It's messy, of course. But Foucault says generally, at the beginning of the early 1800s, then the great spectacle of physical torture disappeared. The tortured body was avoided. It's no, we don't torture people anymore. The theatrical representation of pain was excluded from punishment. Okay, something's happening. Now, go back three pages to page 11. Okay, go back to page 11. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, nine sentences down from the top of page 11. 
And Foucault is now talking about how the new system of punishment, the enlightenment notion of punishment, approaches the body, approaches the individual. Okay? Now, remember, under the feudal aristocratic system of punishment, we saw how power approached, how punishment and power approached the body. <laughs> they tortured the hell out of it and killed it in this, in this sort of phantasmagoria of violence. But something is changing now. Torture is disappearing. That type of dealing with the body, the, 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 the sort of visiting upon the body, extraordinary pain to extract moral and political purposes. That's all gone. And so now, Foucault says, nine, sent sentence, nine lines down from the top, the body, our body, your body. Now, can I just throw something in here quickly? I know I do that too much and I probably mess up the lecture. But remember, Foucault is going to use the emergence of an enlightenment, a new narrative, a new approach to punishment as a metaphor for a series of strategies and techniques that get deployed everywhere, that get deployed in the hospital, that get deployed in the elementary school, that get deployed in the factory, that get deployed in the bureaucracy, that get deployed in the university. Right? So he's gonna, we're going to be talking specifically about this new discourse about punishment and what punishment is supposed to do. It's supposed to rehabilitate the, 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 the person who did something wrong. Right? Well, he's definitely going to tell us that story. But don't ever forget that that specific story that we are following is... Is, 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 a, is, a, is a vehicle to describe enlightenment society in general. Do you understand? This is the key. So when he talks about the body now, it's your body. Now he's going to talk about how the body gets, gets, gets kind of used and is, as, a, as a vehicle for this new type of punishment. Okay, he's going to tell us that story. But, but this story is serving as a vehicle to what has been done to you and I through various institutions, what he will call apparatuses, institutions, machineries, apparatuses throughout enlightenment society. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the hospital when we're born, He's talking about the elementary schools and the high schools that were educated, the universities. Talking about the factories we work in, talking about the bureaucracies and the in the in the in the, in, in the big cubicles we go. This this whole thing. So he's taught when he says the body, he's talking about your body, talking about my body. Now, to be sure, he's talking about the prisoner in the book, but he's talking about us generally. This is the key. This is the hook. All right. So what the hell is going on? The body, our body, now serves as an instrument or intermediary. Okay, this is brilliant. In the feudal aristocratic system, right, what did they do to the body? Damien did something stupid, tried to attack the king, and what did they do to the body? They destroyed it. They crushed it. They annihilated it. Largely because no one gave a shit about Damien. He was a peasant. And two, the moral and political system had to extract some apology from him. But now, now in the Enlightenment, there are new philosophies about the body. Right? Now in the Enlightenment, you and I have natural rights. Right? Right? Hobbes said, Locke said, human beings possess natural rights as a philosophical idea of the emerging enlightenment. And therefore, there are just some things that no government or other human being can do to our bodies. 
without violating some abstract moral law. Natural light concerns what can be done to your body. The emergence of the normative social sciences. Now, now we're going to not just look at the body, but we're going to look at the mind. We're going to figure out why people do the dumb things they do. So, so this is what's happening here. The body now serves as an instrument or intermediary. intermediary. If one intervenes on it, if the prison system intervenes on the body, incarcerates the, 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 the criminal, or if the system intervenes on the body of the student, or the sick child, or the high school student, or the factory worker, if one now intervenes, it's, I know it's kind of clumsy language, but this is what he's talking about. If one intervenes upon the body, in this case to imprison it, right, or to make it work, right, we're gonna, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, inter, we gotta kind of intervene on this body to turn it into a factory worker. We gotta intervene on this body to turn it into a student. We gotta, we gotta intervene on this body to prepare it to work in a cubicle for 60 years. That's what's happening here. The body now serves as an instrument or intermediary. If one intervenes upon it to imprison it or to make it work, it is in order to deprive, deprive the individual of a liberty that is regarded as both a right and property. Okay, so, so, so now punishment, just technically speaking, we're talking about punishment. Now, if we're gonna intervene on the body, if we're gonna punish a body, we don't, we don't torture it and annihilate it, light it on fire. If we're gonna punish the person, if we're gonna intervene on the body, we don't torture and annihilate it anymore. What do we do? We incarcerate it and we deny you freedom, right? We deny something that is objectively yours, your freedom, and we deny you certain rights. You don't have a right to go walking down the street anymore. Now you're a prisoner. So punishment becomes, when you think about punishment intervening on the body, punishment now becomes a kind of restraint. We don't, we don't torture you and annihilate you anymore. In fact, you have a constitutional right not to be tortured anymore in the enlightenment. So now punishment, this new enlightenment notion of punishment, what does it do? Punishment at, at its most basic level is a restriction of freedom, which we claim we possess objectively, and a restriction of rights, which we say we possess, right? And that's what, that's what, that's what being incarcerated is. You're not free to leave, and there's some shit you can't do. You, know, you, just can't, you don't have a right to do whatever you want. You used to, but you don't do. Don't know. So this is what he's talking about. And, and it's the same. If we're, ultimately, ultimately, as this is gonna, as this argument's gonna unfold, we do the same thing to, to children in schools. We deny some of their freedom in these big blocks of time, right? You got recess for an hour, you got lunch for an hour, but the other time you're in you're in this this box, this class. So we're gonna restrict your freedom. You're not free to just go on recess all day. Or the factory worker isn't just free not to fucking show up and work at the factory. We're gonna restrict the freedom and, and gonna kind of restrict, depending on the situation, certain rights. The body now serves as an instrument or intermediary. If one intervenes upon it to imprison it, or to make it work, to train it, turn peasants into lawyers, it is in order to deprive the individual of a liberty that is regarded both as a right and a property. The body, according to this penalty, this new enlightenment notion of punishment, the body is caught up in a system of constraints and privations, obligations and prohibitions. Physical pain, now, right, and we know this, right? Now, physical pain, the pain of the body itself 
is no longer the constituent element of the penalty, right? In the, in the feudal aristocratic system of punishment, we just fucking tortured the body and destroyed it. But now, physical pain, the pain of the body itself, we're not, we're not torturing people in, in the jail down in LA, right? Physical pain, the pain of the body itself, is no longer the constituent element of the penalty. Not, it's not what the penalty is about. The penalty is about denying your freedom and suspending your rights. From being an art of unbearable sensations, punishment has become an economy of suspended rights. If it is still necessary for the law to reach and manipulate the body of the convict, it will do it at a distance in the proper way, according to strict rules and a much higher aim. The higher aim of the enlightenment to, to correct the soul, to rehabilitate the soul of the criminal, to make him or her a good member of society again. Okay. And now, welcome to you. Now all of you have just entered the book. And so, right? Torturing and pain of the body are no longer the purpose. So we don't need executioners anymore. The purpose of punishment, right? If we have to, in this case, because we're talking about criminals or people in the jails, right, is to deny freedom and deny rights. All right. And, and the purpose isn't no longer just to kill the body. The purpose of suspending freedom and suspending rights is to ultimately rehabilitate the prisoner, right? Find out why he or she did what he or she did fix it, find the appropriate punishment so we can rehabilitate the criminal and send him or her back into society. The goal in the enlightenment system of punishment isn't to destroy the body, it is to rehabilitate the soul. Just like the goal in, 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 in forget the prison now, just like the goal of the hospital is, is to bring to birth a healthy baby. And the goal of the elementary school and the high school is to, to, to sort of educate the soul of the student, of the university student. Why? So he or she goes on to be a good factory worker or a good political scientist or a good social worker or a good bureaucrat. And here you are. Professor? Yeah, no, not right now. As a result, right, right in the middle of the page, page 11, as a result of this new restraint, what new restraint? The denial of freedom and rights and the desire to rehabilitate. As a result of this new restraint, a whole army of technicians took over from the executioner. Right, so we don't need the executioner anymore. Who do we need? We need psychiatrists, we need psychologists, we need child development specialists, we need social workers, we need criminologists, therapists, professors. As a result of this new restraint, an entire army of technicians took over from the executioner the immediate anatomists of pain, warders, doctors, chaplains, psychiatrists, psychologists, educationalists, by their very presence near the prisoner, they sing the praises that the law needs. They reassure the prisoner. They reassure it that the body and pain are not the ultimate objects of its punitive action. Right? This is key. Right, and, 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 and the army of technicians are the very intellectuals that are emerging out of the Enlightenment. 
right? So think about it. I mean, in the, in the 1700s, in the 1800s, you, you have the emergence, the early emergence of what we call sociology, what we call psychology, what we call criminology, what we call political science, right? You, you and I are the army of technicians, educated and trained in the quintessential enlightenment institution, California State University, Northridge, created to turn the children of peasants into social technicians, into political scientists, into social workers, into psychotherapists, into therapists, into psychologists. Right? As the enlightenment is emerging, as the new disciplines of the modern intellectual slash enlightenment project, the philosophers, the new scientists of the normative social behavioral medical scientists as they're emerging, as the new social scientists and the urban designers and the political science and the sociologists, as all of these disciplines are emerging in the enlightenment, organized in universities, designed to turn peasants into lawyers. It's churning out the army of technicians. You are part of the army of technicians. All right, you're political science majors. You spent four years, five years, six years, seven years, taking all of these classes, these political science classes, or these sociology classes, or these psychiatry classes, and you've learned this knowledge, which you and I tend to think is objectively true and good, and, we're, and, and, and now we've acquired it. We're a technician, we're a social scientist, and now we're gonna go out, we're gonna fix families and we're gonna fix social policy and tax policy, and we're gonna redesign and optimize urban planning. Right? The, 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 this, this, and, 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 in, and in a weird way, this begins in the prison. In the enlightenment, right? Punishment changes. People, people intellectuals kind of show, they're, they're, philosophically, you're free, you have rights. There are things that shouldn't be done to you. Intellectually, we have these people who are studying things. They're studying child development. They're studying psychiatry. They're studying sociology. They're studying criminology in these new emerging universities that are designed to educate peasants. And, and, and what are we, and, and, and by the way, what are we, why are we doing that in the prison? To rehabilitate the soul. And, and then send the, 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 the prisoner back into society to be a good productive member or to produce young people like you through the, through the prison of the hospital and the elementary school and the high school and the university and your job at the, at the internship to go and produce disciplined people, constructed disciplined people. Page 26. Page 26. Three quarters of the way down, page 26. What the apparatus is, I mean, I'm gonna count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15 lines from the bottom. 15 lines from the bottom. The sentence starts. What the apparatus is and the institutions operate what the prison is, the, the, the prison is an apparatus, it's an institution. The hospital is an apparatus, it's an institution. The factory is an apparatus, it's an institution. CSUN is an apparatus, it's an institution. Okay? When we talk about prisons, we're talking about hospitals, and we're talking about elementary schools, and we're talking about factories, and we're talking about bureaucracies, and we're talking about university lectures what the apparatuses and institutions operate in a sense is a microphysics of power a field of power relationships is a microphysics of power whose field of validity whose field of meaning value and purpose whose field of validity 
whose space, whose scene, whose field of what means things, what things mean, how they have value, and how they're arranged in purposes. When, when Foucault says whose field of validity, that's what he means. Whose field of validity is situated in a sense between the great functionings of the bodies themselves and the materiality of their forces. So, so you and I are put in these institutions, right? We're, we're born into hospitals and we're examined in hospitals. We're educated in schools. We work in factories. Then we go to work in bureau and, or, or we go to work in, in, in bureaucracies in our cubicle. What the app, what all of these apparatuses, what they do is take hold of the body through these three strategies, the organization and control of time and space, the creation of spaces that maximize observation and induce in us a kind of panoptic consciousness, the awareness that we're always being watched, so we're good. And then, and then this constant ongoing examination to examine, extract knowledge, study, do research to fiction. What the great institutions or apparatuses operate is a microphysics of power, a field of power relationships, which are the three strategies that, that kind of give a sense of what things mean, how they're valued, and the purposes towards which they're directed. Top of 27. Second line from the top. Furthermore, Foucault writes, this power, disciplinary power, that's constructing you. You and I are always already in some apparatus, which is a microphysics of power, disciplinary power. The three strategies operating simultaneously to construct a certain type of subjectivity as both the object and vehicle of a kind of of the system of validity, what things mean, why they have value, and the purposes to which they're directed. Furthermore, this power, disciplinary power, is not exercised simply as an obligation or prohibition on those who do not have it. Right? So, so this is a power that isn't, isn't just designed to coerce your behavior, to say no, to punish or coerce, it invests them. This disciplinary power invests you. It constructs you. It invests them. And not only are you the, when, when he says invest, he means you and I are the objects of this power. That's what he means. This power invests them. But it is also transmitted by them and through them. So disciplinary power constructs certain kinds of subjects, in this case, enlightenment subjects, who don't know they're constructed, who then go on and, can, and, and kind of transmit this power. So people are both the objects and the vehicles of power. Power is moving around all the time. You and I are always already, always already, because we're born into a language. We're born into these apparatuses. We're born into these institutions. This language as, as, as meaning and value and, and, and power constructs our agency, but it constructs an agency that doesn't know it's been constructed. And then because it doesn't know it's been constructed, it goes on and, and transmits this power. You're about to leave the university and transmit this power to, to, to the families you fix, to the, to, the, to the people you provide therapy to, to the tax policies you improve. Doesn't matter what we're talking about. Furthermore, disciplinary power is not simply exercised as an obligation or a prohibition on those who don't have it. In, in some ways it is, right? In, in some ways there are like little, little, little moments of hierarchical power. Right. If you if 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 you don't write the, the final, I got to give you an F. Right. That's a kind of kind of material hierarchical little modality of power. Okay. But the fact that I have to give you an F isn't because 
subject in individually. I just want to do that. It's a system. It also invests them, is transmitted by them and through them. It exerts pressure upon them, just as they themselves in their struggle against it, resist it. This means that these relations of power, here we go, when he says relations, but he's talking about relations of power. Reality is an always already open and moving field of relationships of power, open by language and it's, and it's contingent. This means that these relationships of power go right down into the depths of society itself. That they are not localized in the relations between the state and its citizen or on the frontier between classes. And they do not merely reproduce at the level of the individual's bodies, gestures, and behavior. It Disciplinary power constructs people and those people transmit it. So you're misunderstanding power, Foucault says, if you're looking at it in the old way, power between citizens and the states, power between the classes, Marx's whole analysis was between the power of the classes. And while those modalities of power in some ways are real, Right, we, we, in, in certain moments, we can look at the, the kind of power dynamics between an aristocracy and a laboring class, okay. That's not what power is. There's a discourse of power that has made possible our understanding of those relationships. Bottom of 27, and here we get to one of the most famous passages and one of the most misunderstood passages in the world. Again, why postmodernism is one of, one of the most kind of misunderstood things. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine sentences from the bottom. The sentence begins with, we should admit. We, uh, it, from a postmodern point of view, from a Nietzschean, nominalist, postmodern point of view. We should admit rather that power produces knowledge, that power produces knowledge, and not simply by encouraging it because it serves power or by applying it because it is useful, that power and knowledge directly imply one another. There is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. Okay, so this is critical. You hear all the time, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. You hear this all the time. And from a postmodern point of view, the phrase is fundamentally misunderstood. So it's not that knowledge is power. It's that there is a direct connection. They're simultaneous. They imply and infer each other. Power, knowledge, power. It's, it's, not, it's, not, that, it's not that knowledge is power. In fact, that would be a metaphysical way of looking at it because you, you, would, you, you, would, you would quantify it and, and, you'd make it and you'd make it objective. What is power? Oh, knowledge. Knowledge is, is, the verb is. Predicate, is. Knowledge is power. Okay, so what is, what, 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 what is power? Oh, it's knowledge. Oh, what is knowledge? Oh, it's power. By the way, you, even thinking of it like that isn't quite right because then you think that there's something objectively true about that, and it's not. The statement, knowledge slash power, or first, power slash knowledge, right? And, 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 and think about it, right? Let, let's go back to the ancient Greeks just to have fun, just to have fun. The Iliad and the Odyssey are human what? Inventions. 
And they're also simultaneously an assertion of what? Power. And because they are human inventions and assertions of power, they constitute, they create, they invent, they constitute what becomes the what? The Greek world. And they constitute or invent what becomes the Greek world by naming and defining and valuing what stuff means and what it values and how it all hangs together. And that system produces a kind of a knowledge. Okay, so who is powerful in that system? Oh, the poets. And therefore, and then once that system of knowledge gets created, that knowledge becomes a kind of, a kind of tool of power in, in the discourse. So power produced knowledge. The Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey as a human invention, but equally as important simultaneously, an assertion of power, invented the Greek world in which a certain type of knowledge possessed by the poets had power. Knowledge, so power produces knowledge. And then the knowledge inside any particular society is maintained by a kind of power. Power produces knowledge, knowledge reinforces power. That's how it works. That's, that's what a discourse is. And now you and I are living in a discourse produced by power, right? In this, in, in this case, a kind of new set of human uh, ideas uh, called the Enlightenment about philosophy. People are free, they're morally equal, they're radically individualistic, and they possess natural rights. And a set of ideas that emerge with science, the, 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 the normative social and behavioral and medical sciences, and about politics. Right? These are ideas. These are, these are kind of human inventions that function as a search into power. And they produce a kind of knowledge. I'm one of those idiots. I got a PhD. Right? They produce people who have knowledge. And for whatever reason, those people with that knowledge in the system have power. I, have, I don't have economic power, but I've got social power. Right? I go places, people call me doctor or, or whatever, whatever, whatever you think that power is. It's produced by the knowledge I theoretically acquired through the PhD. So power produces knowledge, knowledge reinforces power. You're doing the same thing. Power produced you. Disciplinary power produced you. To have a kind of knowledge, you're one of the army of technicians, political science. Now you're going to have kind of a social and cultural power. You're going to go out and someone's going to give you a job and you're going to fix things. And so you're going to reinforce those relationships of power. Power produces knowledge. Knowledge reinforces power. They're simultaneous. They imply each other. It's not knowledge is power. It's not that. Knowledge power. Power knowledge. We should admit that power produces knowledge. That power and knowledge directly imply one another. That there is no power relation without the correlative, the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge. The Iliad and the Odyssey, as both an invention and assertion of power, open a field of knowledge. It creates the Greek world in which a kind of knowledge, certain kinds of knowledges are more valuable than others. That power and knowledge directly imply one another. That there is no power relationship without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge. Nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. We're in one right now. I possess knowledge because this Enlightenment society thinks that this is important. I got this stupid PhD from an Enlightenment institution, and now I'm speaking to you and you're writing things down. Okay. Power produced the knowledge. 
I have that knowledge, and now I'm conveying those relationships of power. But it's, but it's not because I'm objective, there's something objectively special or true or brilliant or fascinating about Nick Dungy. Nick Dungy was produced by the power to have a kind of knowledge. And now I'm, it's, it's moving from me to you and it's gonna go from you to, to, to somebody else or to other families or institutions, other relationships of power. These power knowledge relations are to be analyzed therefore, not on the basis of a subject of knowledge who is or who is not free, right? right? Who is or is not free in relationships to the power system, but on the contrary, the subject who knows the objects to be known and the modalities of knowledge must be regarded as so many effects of these fundamental implications of power slash knowledge and their historical transformations. There you go. Twenty-nine. We'll finish off with this. Right in the middle of the page. A little, little further down than the middle. It would be wrong, Foucault writes, it would be wrong to say that the soul is an illusion. And when he talks about soul, he means your constructed identity. You and I are real. It's not an illusion. We're real. This is a real conversation. But it doesn't mean that we are objectively true. It would be wrong to say that the soul is an illusion. Subjectivity is an illusion. Identity. On the contrary, it exists. It has a reality. It is produced permanently around, on, within the body by the functioning of a power that is exercised on those who are punished or trained. And in a more general way, on those one supervises, trains and corrects over madmen, children at home and at school, the colonized over those who are stuck at a machine and supervised for the rest of their lives. This, this real, this real, but not metaphysical soul it is not a substance. It is the element in which are articulated the effects of a certain type of power and the reference of a certain type of knowledge. The machinery, the apparatus, the machine, you're in a machinery right now. The machinery by which the power relations gives rise to possible bodies of knowledge. And then how that knowledge extends and, re, and reinforces the effects of this power. On this reality reference, various concepts have been constructed and domains of analysis carved out. The psyche, subjectivity, personality, consciousness. On it have been built scientific techniques and discourses. But, top of page 30, but let there be no misunderstanding. It is not that an objectively real person. It is not that a real man, he means objective, True. It is not that a real man, the object of knowledge, philosophical reflection, or technical invention has been substituted for the soul, the illusion of the theologian. The man described for us, you and I, the man described for us whom we are invited to free is already in himself the effect of a subjection power constitutes subjectivity that subjectivity becomes a vehicle for power that person is already the effect of a subjection much more profound than himself a soul inhabits him and brings him into existence which is itself a factor in the mastery that power exercises over the body. And then again, this last line, one of the most famous in all Foucault, 
So Foucault at this point reverses the metaphysical relationship between the body and the soul. In the metaphysical theory, right, whether Platonic or Christian, in the metaphysical theory, we say that the body traps the soul, right? Right? Socrates was happy to die so the soul could leave the body. The Christians say, the Christians say that the soul is trapped in a body. Postmodernism reverses it. Subjectivity, this constructed account of the soul, by which he means subjectivity, this constructed account of the soul traps the body. The body is trapped by the soul. The body is trapped by the soul, which means, right? So again, now let's step back. What are the effects to our minds, our bodies, and our politics that result from our belief in an objective truth and our commitment to its moral and normative practices? If our belief, our subjectivity, and our belief that a truth exists and we're committed to our practices, if that in fact is itself a construction and it shapes how our consciousness works, how we hold and carry and convey our bodies and what we do, then subjectivity traps the body. It's not that the body traps the soul, the soul traps the body. All right. Have a fabulous holiday. Have an absolutely fabulous holiday. And have a great Thanksgiving. All my love to you and your family. And when we come back on Tuesday, we start part three, chapter one. Thank you, Dungy. Yep. Love you guys. Love you, love you, love you. Yep. Have a great Thank holiday. You, man. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other.